Okay, hi, this is uh, Chris Carlson. Uh, I'm a longtime uh, graphics developer with Wolfram Research, and now I'm a jack of all trades. Uh, I'm here with um, Harry Calkins and Paratosh Makashi uh, to answer as many of your questions as we can. Um, so uh, I'll start off with a, uh, with a general question. People are asking after uh, Stephen Wolfram's talk at South by Southwest what the difference is between Mathematica and the Wolfram language. And the answer is, if, if you know Mathematica, you know the Wolfram language. The, um, so Mathematica is a shrink wrap desktop product that bundles uh, an interface along with a programming language. That language is the Wolfram language. And the Wolfram language is essentially uh, only the language part extracted from Mathematica. So it runs in not only Mathematica, but also in the forthcoming Wolfram Cloud. Uh, you can deploy it in many different ways, including to Raspberry Pis, to uh, Intel Edison's, um, in lots of different ways. So um, the, the answer is, uh, for all practical purposes, they're the same thing, but the Wolfram language has escaped the bonds of Mathematica and uh, uh, will be useful in many, many different ways uh, other than just within desktop Mathematica. Um, Let's see here. Somebody, I don't have the name right in front of me, asked how you can use Emacs key bindings in Mathematica. Um, actually, many of the Emacs key bindings are already in Mathematica, and I'm proud to say that they're there because I insisted that they be there because Mathematica key bindings are in my brain stem. They don't even reach my brain. They're just in my fingers. So for example, control A goes to the beginning, control P, goes up a line, control N goes down a line. Uh, so many of the key bindings are already there, you might not have noticed. Um, there is unfortunately no uh, interface level way of changing those key binds, bindings in Mathematica. Um, but I'll tell you something that I probably shouldn't tell you, which is that uh, there is a file in the layout. If you search for um, key event bindings.tr, uh, you can, if you're brave, open that file, it's an ASCII file, and edit it and add uh, bindings of any sort that you like. And I think if you look at that file and especially look for uh, the kinds of things um, that relate to Emacs key bindings, it'll be pretty obvious how you can add your own key bindings to that file. You edit that file, save it to the same place you found it, and the next time you run Mathematica, those bindings will be there. Um, Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Harry Calkins, who has uh, some questions. Okay, uh, we've seen lots of good questions coming in here today. Some of them are beyond the scope of things we can answer, uh, but uh, we'll try to, uh, as Chris said, we're going to try to get to as many as we can. Here's one that we get very often. This is from Jeremy, and the question is, uh, what's your recommendation for finding built-in functions? Uh, are there any good tips to figure out uh, which ones you might use that would uh, optimize your code? Well, the, one of the first things you want to get used to in uh, using Mathematica is to um, learn about using the documentation center. And I just lost my cursor. I lose my cursor about every five minutes here. Here we go. So here is our documentation center as it exists in current builds. Uh, this appearance is going to change a little bit, but the functionality is all going to be there as we go uh, move into the future and focus more on the grand scheme of the Wolfram language. And um, you'll notice that we've broken this up into a number of different categories. And this can be very, very useful. Uh, you can uh, go in here if you're looking for operations on lists, for example. Uh, you can come in here and click on this, and then you'll come up with a page that says list manipulation. We try to provide learning resources wherever they might be available to you. And so here we have things like making lists of objects and getting pieces of lists, combining lists, things of that sort. And I, it, you have to do a little bit of searching initially, uh, but I, I think you'll find that it, it really pays off. And um, there are three of us here who do a lot of uh, development work. Uh, Chris and Partos do a lot more than I do. But uh, one of the things that all of us will tell you is uh, we're all very familiar with the Documentation Center because it provides you 
with the kind of information you need. And with over 3,000 functions, you're never going to remember what all of them do. Uh, so let's uh, take uh, something uh, like, well, here, uh, Mathematica, uh, mathematics and algorithms and, and things of that sort. So let's go here to equation solving. Now, when we get to this page, first off, we have some featured examples. And then uh, down here under reference, you'll see we have solve, end solve, find root. And a lot of people don't realize that each one of these is designed to do a particular kind of thing. Solve is designed to provide symbolic solutions. And what that means is it's very efficient with things like uh, polynomials and things of that sort. You start getting into transcendental functions, you're probably going to have trouble. End solve. Um, Solve will have trouble periodically with um, non-exact coefficients. For example, if you say 0.5 times x as opposed to x divided by 2, solve is going to do much better with x divided by 2 than it is with 0.5 times x. Find root, well, n solve is designed to overcome some of those uh, difficulties. Because what nSolve does is it automatically looks at the information you've given to the program, converts it over to exact values, tries to find a solution, and then converts it back to the numerical values uh, in general. Sometimes it just works with what it has. Find root is specifically designed to work with numerical values. Now, now in, when I say numerical values, I mean a number that has a decimal point in it. And find root just uses a uh, uh, standard methods for Newton's methods for finding roots or um, methods of maximum descent, things of that sort. And most people don't realize that find root, if you just click on this, it will take you to the documentation page. Um, find root, uh, you, this will uh, solve when is the sine of x plus e to the x uh, equal to zero, but you can actually put an equation in there. When is the cosine of x equal to x? Now, the thing that is limiting about the find root is that it requires that you give a good start value. And if you give a good start value, it's going to be very fast. If you give a bad start value, it can take a while, and it can actually just run off to infinity, which is not terribly not good. You can also put bounds on, this, on those things. So when you look at the documentation, don't just stay with the first examples. Check under details and options. I find that half the questions I want to ask are answered in the details and options. And I just mentioned you can put uh, bounds on things. I got an equation. I want to find where these two sides are equal to one another. It's in the variable x. I can say start here, but don't go below x min and don't go above x max. And it will tell you, I've reached the bounds that you've given me, and we don't have a good solution at this point. But these are the kinds of things that you can do. What you're going to find is if initially you spend quite a bit of time in the documentation center, uh, after you have worked with Mathematica for a few months, spending time every day in the documentation center, a lot of these things stick with you when you think, oh, there's that function. What did I do yet the other day? I'll go get it. I'll look at it. And I can um, quickly uh, get the results that I'm uh, searching for. Um, there is no simple answer when you have 3,000 functions to choose from to say, always go to this one because it's always going to do what you want because part of the time it will do what you want and part of the time there's a better function to use. And um, once you're on that function page, pay particular attention to what's down here at the bottom under C, all, uh, C also. Find an instance. Is there a, can you find a situation in which the expression that I've given to the uh, program is uh, actually true? Things of that sort. And you'll notice as you move from one function to another, this list down here grows and shrinks. So there are lots and lots of possibilities for handling the same kinds of problems. Well, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Paratosh because I've already talked way too long anyway. Let's see my screen. I'm going to go ahead and... All right. So uh, one of the questions that came from uh, Sumit, I believe, uh, is about, you know, um, he's uh, the question is basically, uh, is Fortran or Python, is that going to give me uh, faster results? Uh, and, you know, if, if I delve into the uh, area of loops 
then am I going to, uh, is Mathematica going to be slow? Well, that's a question, uh, that's basically a, a programming question. If you, if you decide to use looping constructs naively inside of Mathematica, uh, then obviously it's going to be slower it's go because it's a high-level functionality. However, that, that's where uh, if you were to take advantage of vector functions, so for example, let's say I do, uh, I'm going to construct just a data random real, uh, let's say 10 to the power 6, comma 2. Then this is a matrix. It's a pretty large matrix. Now let's say that I wanted to, so if I look at the, uh, look at it, okay, so now what I want to do is for each one of these elements, I'm, I, I want to uh, add these two numbers together. And there, there are several ways to do that, of course. Uh, I'll, if I were to use a func uh, 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 functional programming concept, I could do something like map, total, data and give me a result i'll just put that as solution and let's just do a timing on that right and you say it takes 0.25 seconds now of course uh, if i were to do it in a loop it'll take a lot longer um, but uh, let me show you one more approach which would be um, well let's say solution one transpose the data and then total that and you'll see that this should be a lot faster. You see, I've already sped it up significantly. I can also do data uh, two, two being, I want to add the columns. Let's see what's the timing of that, even faster. So even with, even in the high uh, functional programming concepts, depending upon how you utilize or how you manipulate your data, you can actually get a comparable, if not a better performance um, uh, with regards to uh, you know uh, numerical computations uh, when you're looking at Python or uh, Fortran programming. Okay, uh, the second uh, question I want to um, address is with regards to and it's an ND solve question. I'm trying to find my cursor here. Um, the ND solve question was from Oleg that talks about you know what are the different ways. Uh, or rather, which is an easier approach to um, uh, to represent ODEs or system of ODEs in ND salts uh, so that, you know, the representation is easier. So what we can, uh, so here's an example. So I can write an equation dot, and now because this is a matrix, I'm just going to go ahead and write this equation down, and you'll see that actually ND solve has no trouble interpreting vector based operations. So here's my equation, here's my initial condition. If I do ND solve equation, I see x is now a vector variable, but we don't explicitly specify it to be one. Well, you go ahead and solve that. I'm going to um, take that. I'm going to put in all sorts of cryptic things. There we go. And uh, if you look at S3 of point 0.1, you'll see that it's a vector variable. Okay, so um, depending upon your uh, uh, about you know uh, what your application is, if you you can also write functions that can automate the generation of uh, these kind of differential equations, and then basically uh, use them in a scalar format to in a, to put them inside of ND solve. So. Uh, Again, this comes down to uh, what you're comfortable with and how you would deal with. NDSolve will uh, does a pre-processing step, and so um, uh, so all that is taken care of internally. Uh, so, to the user, uh, the choice is yours. Okay. Let's um, move to uh, one more question here. There's a question from Klaus on interpolating function, um, and he asks whether um, uh, well, the interpolating function. Some of the um, some of the options are not completely documented. That's not completely true. Uh, we try to be as transparent as possible, especially in a, in, a, in the numerics area. Um, uh, we try to give as much details. Now, they they might not be in the obvious place. So let me just um, give you an example. So I'm going to do uh, interpolation. Oops. Interpolation, come on, range 10. Okay, so that produces an interpolating function. And now, of course, uh, Klaus correctly pointed out that there's something called as domain, which I can give in um, a string, and it'll give me the domain of 
uh, over which it's been interpolated. There are other uh, uh, methods available. Uh, I believe uh, if you do methods, you'll get a list of the list of the properties that you can access. Okay, so uh, for example, you could do interpolating function of uh, coordinates and it'll get it'll get back the domain of course in this case it's just a trivial one two three four you get values of grid etc now i uh, in in um, uh, in uh, the next release we have added uh, or um, i specifically have added a lot more uh, uh, method option functionality in there that will allow you to dig deeper inside the interpolating function so that's something to look forward to let's uh, take one more question before i uh, I, we circle back to um, Chris. Okay, uh, Robert uh, uh, asks a question about how you could use uh, as, uh, use n solve and only get the real numbers out uh, or only the real solutions uh, from the from the problem. And the answer is simply uh, you can provide it as an option. Or rather, you know, just a just a constraint uh, towards n solve. So, for example, if I do n solve, um, let's make x cube minus one equal to zero with regards to x. I get two my, uh, two complex numbers and one real number. If I wanted to get if I wanted to get the just the real part. Or, or only the real solutions, you just give the additional option of reals. Now, I, of course, I know this because I've worked with the NSolve before, so this was obvious to me, but uh, the best place, and as Harry pointed out, is to go to the documentation. I mean, um, that's your best friend in, in cases like these. These uh, All these variations and the options and the methods that you can put in have are very well documented in there. Uh, look under properties and relations and scope, and you should be able to get uh, all the different variations. Okay, um, so with that, I'm going to hand over, uh, uh, hand the mic back to Chris, and um, and I'll take some more questions a little later. Chris, all yours. Okay. Okay, uh, let me follow up on uh, the question about the relationship between the Wolfram language and Mathematica. So some there were some other questions uh, that I saw. Um, uh, one is, uh, or two related questions are, is Wolfram language the next version of Mathematica? And can Mathematica version 9 users upgrade to the Wolfram language? Um, the Wolfram language is a component of Mathematica. So whatever goes into the Wolfram language goes into Mathematica as well. Um, so um, you upgrade to the Wolfram language, or the latest version of the Wolfram language anyway, by upgrading Mathematica. Um, if I'm told that there's a resources area uh, in this um, <clears throat> uh, in, in the online area where you can um, find information about the Wolfram language, and if you go to our to there or to our main uh, web page, there is information on the Wolfram language, including a set of examples that you can explore to see uh, what the Wolfram language is all about. And you'll see in those examples some things which are new and are not implemented in version 9. Uh, all of those things will be available uh, in the Wolfram Cloud when that goes live soon, and also in the next version of Mathematica. So you can get a preview of upcoming functionality by uh, taking a look at those examples. Uh, Mackenzie asks if CDF uh, will be available for iPad. CDF is our computable document format. <clears throat> it's uh, a way to deploy Mathematica notebooks in a way that anybody uh, can use them. And yes, it will eventually be available on iOS uh, products like the iPad. It's a challenging project. It's in the works, and we're all anxious to see it. Um, it will be out sometime. Um, here's a fun question. So um, Mackenzie asks, can you get the population of your own city uh, within Mathematica? So many people don't realize you can actually do programming on Mathematica using uh, natural language. And the, the path to that is control equals. So if you just type control equals population of Urbana 
Illinois, it will give you the population. And it will also tell you what the programmatic equivalent of that natural language query is. And if I click this, it'll just replace what I could have typed programmatically to get uh, the same answer. Now you can also, you can actually embed natural language right in calculation. So suppose I want to know the uh, population density of Urbana. So I have this expression which gives me the population. I say divided by and now control equals uh, area of Urbana, Illinois. And there it is, 3,500 some per square mile. Uh, so that's a very handy thing to know. And that's actually a useful way to learn uh, mathematical programming. And uh, one final question uh, from Peter asks if the if Stephen Wolfram's South by Southwest talk is available online. <clears throat> I know his talk from from 2013 was made available by the South by Southwest people. There's a blog post coming out on uh, stephenwolfram.com sometime this week, which has a um, a transcript and and all the graphics from his talk. And I believe there may be a video associated with that blog post. But uh, so keep an eye out for that blog post this week, and uh, check back with South by Southwest to see when they put their talks uh, online. So I'll hand it over to Harry. We've got a couple more uh, good questions here. Uh, Tom asks, uh, please comment on the use of up values to improve performance. Um, up values, in, in many cases, improve performance in the sense that it's really easy sometimes to write code that isn't very efficient to do something when you could just use up values and get it to work. Basically, the idea of up values, though, is overloading a function. Mathematica has, as I said, 3,000 functions, 3,000 plus functions, some of which uh, we enter in uh, using standard everyday notation, but which can also be entered uh, other ways. For example, if I say plus a uh, comma b comma c, uh, what this re I'm, I'm putting in dots here. I want commas. <laughs> uh, this will give you uh, the sum. So we have a function to do addition. And that same function is the function that adds vectors and all kinds of other things in Mathematica. Uh, now, supposing I was defining some uh, operation that I uh, wanted to return something that was a little bit different than that. But I basically, I wanted to think of it as addition. So what I would probably do is I would define a uh, what we could uh, refer to as a data type, which just means that we construct something that has a particular head in the expression. This thing is called a Mathematica expression. The thing out in front here is called the head of the expression. And so let's uh, do something like uh, OP of um, A, oh, whoops. I keep hitting the wrong spaces on my thing. And if I put in plus here, uh, OP, and then uh, put in B, it doesn't know what to do. Well, it doesn't know what to do because it has no idea what an op is. But I want to overload this so that it actually returns something. And so what I would do is I would put out here op, and then uh, this notation here tells the program don't pay any attention to the plus. Actually look at these things. So I'm going to add these two things together. And I'm going to add them in a rather strange way. I'm going to get op of, uh, say, 2a uh, plus uh, 3b. Now this, of course, is a non-commutative addition and so forth. But when I make a definition like this, now if I were to come back and do this here and add these things, it returns the thing that I want. Notice what I have actually done here is add an addition to the built-in Mathematica function plus. 
And this will continue to work as long as I stay in this same session of the kernel. Now, clearly, if I drop out, quit the kernel or something, and then come back, I have to reintroduce that definition. But you can do many, many things this way. I find, particularly working with graphics, I can create a, a collection of um, coordinates or something of the sort. And then I want to plot that thing. Uh, I can make everything work very quickly and easily. And I see we're just about out of time. But there was one more question that I wanted to answer, and that was, uh, with list line plot, how do you know whether or not the arguments are held? Use attributes list line plot, and it will tell you. If it, it will say hold first, hold all, or something like that, and that will take care of it. Hey guys, it's Paritosh again. Um, I, before we um, uh, close out the session, there are just one more uh, question um, that I wanted to talk about, which is the use of reap and sow, uh, which was, there are multiple questions that have been asked once by George and um, I believe uh, Josh, they've been asking about um, reap and sow. And uh, reap and sow is actually quite fast uh, and it's it's the, the recommended approach when you're, uh, when you're um, uh, you know, uh, collecting all sorts of data from different functions. Uh, the other one, George, that I, uh, I can recommend, uh, which it's sort of an internal function, but um, Danny Licklow from our, from the from our group uh, from our company has written a fantastic post on uh, Stack Exchange, uh, which makes use of internal bags, internal backtick stuff bag bag part, uh, and that and those uh, have linear timings. So uh, it's uh, order n uh, time associated with it uh, in order to get all the data collocated together. And so that's another uh, that's an approach that uh, that I I I, also, I make use of quite a lot. Reap and sow is is actually my preferred method. The documentation is uh, pretty complete. If you just have to go through it, there's a lot to consume in there. So uh, if you go through it slowly, you'll be able to catch on to that. Another uh, thing that I want to uh, point out is to make use of tags when you're doing the reap and sow. That really really helps. Okay, so um, we're out of time at this point. So um, so we'll have to show, close here. Uh, there are so many questions that we couldn't get to, but uh, I hope you you were able to enjoy uh, and get some, a lot of information from these seminars. Uh, there is a talk by Arnoud uh, on Raspberry Pi, uh, and I th I think that'll be a very beneficial talk for uh, for everybody in the uh, in, in today's group. Um, so I highly recommend that you go and uh, talk uh, and and view that uh, uh, seminar.